the tidings of the king's death were brought to his successor, Louis d'Orléans, at Blois, where he was living in disfavor. He became Louis XII. From the outset, the Chateau of Blois seems to have been destined to perpetual reconstruction. It displays an odd juxtaposition of virtually every style somewhat resembling a manual of architecture. From its medieval origins through to the classical style, it has a bit of everything. With Louis XII's help, we move from the residence of a private citizen to that of a king. Louis XII had two reasons for trying to obliterate with Blois the work of his predecessor at Amboise. He had married the latter's widow, Anne de Bretagne, whose coat of arms is shown here, and in addition to the fact that Amboise was a sharp reminder of his period of disfavor, its style suddenly seemed outdated. Here, history repeated itself in every respect. In his turn, Louis XII relived the tragedy of Charles VIII. His three sons by Anne de Bretagne died in infancy, and his daughter, Claude de France, heiress to the maternal duchy of Brittany, married the king's successor, her cousin, who became Francis I. France thus became wedded to Brittany for the third time. Like Louis XII, Francis I was eager to erase the marks of his predecessors from Blois. The sumptuous wing that he began building in the first year of his reign stands out as a masterpiece of French 16th century architecture in its Italianized period. The famous staircase, a masterpiece of architectural ornamentation, a fabulous axis that, for the first time, had been placed on the outside, is a tower that has been emptied, adorned and carved, polarizing everything, the ideal instrument for occasions of large gatherings. Of this singular epoch, Francis I, whose personal symbol, a golden salamander, is found everywhere, was the greatest builder. The loggia facade, which lets the Chateau of Blois open out expansively towards the town, is a clean break with the sealed-in, forbidding nature of medieval outer walls, thereby accurately symbolizing the victory of the Renaissance. The fleur de lys, the salamander and the ermine are not just gratuitous ornaments. This armorial profusion marked the end of the feudal world and a quasi-achievement of French unity. Francis I's glorious reign was soon to be succeeded by a long period of unrest that was complicated by the dynastic problem of three monarchs who left no posterity. The three sons of Henry II and Catherine de Medici succeeded one another on the French throne. Francis II, Charles IX and Henry III. The period was dominated by the enigmatic, legendary figure of Catherine de Medici. She died in the Chateau of Blois at the heart of the tragedy that her Florentine sense of intrigue expressed here in her secret drawer cabinet had been unable to ward off. In the twilight of the Valois dynasty, at the end of the vast melee of civil and religious warfare, the Chateau of Blois was the setting for one of French history's greatest tragedies, the assassination of the Duc de Guise in the king's bedroom. The real drama lay in the gothic decor of the state's general room. The two rival factions that were rendering asunder Henry III's France were led by Henri de Guise, the Catholic leader, and by Henri de Bourbon, the future Henry IV and leader of the Huguenots. The so-called War of the Three Henrys threatened to tear France apart. Henry III, who had to flee Paris because of the Guise rebellion, 
hoped to remedy matters by convening the States General in the main hall of Blois. But the Duc de Guise was bent on getting the crown, and the assembly was made up only of his partisans. Unable to exert his authority, the monarch had to resign himself to assassinating the two enemies who were his greatest threats, the Duc de Guise and the latter's brother, the Cardinal of Lorraine. The eventual consequence of this double execution was the murder of Henry III himself and the advent of the great reign of Henry IV, the sole survivor of this fratricidal struggle between three princes. The monarchy would thenceforth be officiating in Paris, and history would be happening but seldom in the Loire Valley. From the time of Francis I to the reign of Henry IV, the entire valley of the Loire had gradually become occupied by the itinerant court whose wandering verged on vagabondage. The court betook itself from one chateau to another, depending on the caprices of fancy, the pleasures of the hunt, and the political situation. It was like a whole city on the march, forming an enormous, picturesque, noisy caravanserai, transporting its furniture, linen, paintings, wardrobe, relics, and archives, because it was actually a state apparatus that was on the move, followed by members of all the trades and by horses and hounds. It is hard to conjure up a clear picture of this immense horde which, when it arrived somewhere, found only an empty shell and which, at its departure, left an empty shell behind it. Francis I, a great creator of beauty, passionately devoted to architecture, could not be content with redecorating premises haunted by his predecessors. He built Chambord, an abode designed to be a showcase for his mark alone. Chambord is the unique masterpiece of a kind that has no other examples, nor any imitations, the image of an amazing reign. Chambord, the ultimate in royal dwellings, heralded the advent of Versailles by its sheer size. It boasts 440 rooms and by the regularity of its symmetrical layout. It looms like the swan song of medieval symbolism, the perfect expression of Renaissance theatricality. The innovation was of a political nature, and if this palace is a stage set, that is because the monarchy itself had become a spectacle. The roof terraces and chimneys, a triumph of the lyric flowering of Italian-style ornaments, stand around a 32-meter skylight tower up which winds the world's most famous staircase, whose design is ascribed to Leonardo da Vinci. This famed double spiral stairway, with its two spirals that are superposed but never meet, remains a technical achievement of rare beauty. Chambord, conceived by the rapturous enthusiasm of a young prince drunk with glory, is actually a sort of dream poised halfway between the Loire country and Italy. Over the years, however, history proved stronger than the king's will. The setbacks, sorrows and dangers incurred by France in its war against Emperor Charles V called Francis I back to Paris, and he eventually became attached to Fontainebleau, which was nearer. The kings thenceforth stayed only for brief periods at Chambord. None of Francis I's successors ever succeeded in decorating the huge chateau. One hundred years after its abandonment, Louis XIV pitted his youthful glory against the nostalgic shadow of his remote predecessor by giving lavish entertainments at Chambord, planned and staged by Molière and Lully. Two more centuries passed. And, after the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, the great 
glamorous chateau was the setting for the monarchy's last attempt at a comeback in the person of Henry V, the so-called Comte de Chambord, who rang down destiny's final curtain on several centuries of history. Total abandonment followed, making Chambord into what Alfred de Vigny likened to a magic castle. He wrote, It is as if, constrained by some wondrous lamp, an eastern genie had kidnapped it during one of the thousand and one nights and had removed it from the realm of the sun in order to conceal it in the realm of mist. After the period of the feudal castles and the great royal chateaus of the Renaissance, a new era had dawned, that of the manor houses, dwellings of varying degrees of lavishness belonging to private citizens who erected buildings patterned on those of the monarch. The chateau of Azé le Rideau emerges today as the purest masterpiece of a new concept of architecture and life. The feudal castles were made for concealment, the royal chateaus were designed for showing off on a transient basis. The manor house was meant to be lived in for setting up housekeeping. For Asile le Rideau, which is so famous today, was not a royal chateau, far from it. It was built by a financier named Gilles Berthelot, whose wife supervised the construction with all the artistic insight and practical knowledgeability of a true lady of the Renaissance. This costly indulgence boded ill for its owner, who was president of the audit office. He had to flee abroad to escape being hanged. Under those conditions, the medallions of kings and queens of France on the ceiling of this handsome staircase were an utterly superfluous homage paid to the power. Once confiscated, Azé le Rideau did not, however, become Azé le Royal. Francis I, of course, paid it a visit and doubtless admired it. But finding nothing he could add to it, he gave it to the captain of his guards. The delightful manor house eventually deserted the confines of history and entered the realm of art and architecture. It was acquired by France's Fine Arts Ministry and since 1906 has housed a museum of Renaissance art. <laughs> <laughs> 